Okay, so thanks for that, Will. And uh, thanks uh, to the Haven Center for inviting me. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here. Um, it's really one of the great pleasures of life as an academic to have people actually listen to what you spend all this time by yourself uh, working on. So I don't take this for granted. I know everybody's really busy this time of year, so I, I very much appreciate you all coming out. Um, and it, it, this is especially cool because of all the people, uh, the really cool people who have been at the Haven Center over the years. So I feel enormously honored to be here, so thank you. Now, I never really began my life thinking that I wanted to do uh, historical research or really research of any kind. Um, I mean, of course, I guess nobody really begins their life thinking they want to do that, but at least my sort of conscious life. Um, but I knew from very early on in my undergraduate career that I wanted to teach. In spite of a lot of the current political conversation about teachers, which I'm guessing some of you know something about, believe it or not, uh, I didn't decide that I wanted to do this because I was interested in an easy, high-paying job that had summers off. Um, okay, so uh, here's this kind of uh, uh, representation. Believe it or not, it's really easy to find political cartoons making fun of teachers uh, on the internet. Um, nor was I really all that interested in finding ways to bankrupt cities. And uh, uh, obviously this is a depiction of uh, Karen Lewis uh, from the Chicago Teacher Strike of 2012, uh, which uh, uh, I'm obviously really disappointed that she's not going to be running against Rahm Emanuel, but I hope that she has a speedy recovery, as I'm sure many of you do. Um, or another image. And uh, as much as I like seeing a Cubs fan sort of being trampled here, I, I, grew, up, I grew up a few hours away from St. Louis. Um, so I'm a lifelong Cardinals fan. I'll just point out that uh, the Cardinals are playing in the NLCS right now, doing this instead, so just so you know. Um, uh, but, but I didn't become a teacher because I wanted to trample on the public, right? Um, like most people who become teachers, uh, like most people who become teachers, I'll just leave this one up here for you, I did so because I value education, and I enjoy seeing students learn. Uh, I spent several years working at a high school in North Philadelphia, working with some of the poorest students in the city, right after the passage of No Child Left Behind. And uh, incidentally, I remember even at the time, uh, back in uh, 2002, 2003, trying to explain to administrators how, administrators how absurd it was to have a goal of 100% proficiency, uh, and, and remember saying that there would be this kind of political fix for it, and we've seen that actually with just about every state getting waivers now. But so. Uh, to Richard Rashawn, my former principal, I told you so, uh, but he wasn't very uh, interested in listening to this, so we kept doing a lot of test prep. The high school I worked at featured close to 100% free and reduced uh, lunch, which for those of you who uh, don't know, is an indicator of socioeconomic status in schools. And even though I felt like what I was doing was pretty successful, I still hear from students every so often from those days. Uh, the students that I taught uh, for two years, and no, I wasn't in Teach for America, uh, were the first graduating uh, students of a new charter school in Philly in 2005. Many of these students now have college degrees, and uh, this experience, I think, sort of proved to me that with a lot of support from good teachers and high expectations in a safe learning environment, any student really can do pretty well, can really can do well. But the experience left me aware of two things. First, as an employee of a charter school, it left me aware of what it was like to work without uh, union protection of any kind. And second, it left me really aware of the massive odds that my students faced in a really, really unfair society. Now, my students had parents who often couldn't attend parent-teacher meetings because, uh, like so many other of today's working class, uh, they worked several jobs to make ends meet, forced to work flexible hours, um, um, and my students were routinely hassled by the police to the point where it was kind of a daily um, uh, topic and conversation. A lot of these memories really kind of welled up for me uh, over the summer uh, with the events in Ferguson. Uh, one of my favorite students was trying so hard to do well in school that he actually came to school with a pretty major stab wound one day. Uh, two of my students have been murdered since graduating. The last time I saw any of my students, in fact, uh, was for a funeral several years ago. So this is the kind of world that no one should have to grow up in, but it exists. Um, and I was, I was nauseated at the time and continue to be now 
by the kind of nostrums that these sort of these sort of quick fix nostrums uh, uh, that are you constantly hear uh, by sort of uh, education pundits about how any student can easily overcome the kind of structural impediments they face with good teaching. So this is what really impelled me to do further research. Sorry, I've got to have a Marco Rubio moment. Trying to understand the historical trajectory of race and class in the US. To understand how such inequality can exist in a society as wealthy and in a lot of really important ways as democratic as the United States can be. So I didn't know how in the world I was going to do this, but I realized pretty early in my graduate career that an incredibly transformative period in American history was the 1970s. Because you could see that before and after the 1970s, there were a very different set of assumptions, cultural and political assumption, uh, assumptions, uh, guiding American policy, uh, guiding both politics and education policy. In the years after World War II, as many of us know, unions helped working people do better than they ever had before, flattened inequality, uh, the social safety net was expanded from its really modest New Deal origins, and in the 50s and 60s, because of civil rights activists, major policy shifts in both the courts and from Congress finally recognized, albeit imperfectly, the scale of the disadvantages faced by uh, African Americans and other minorities in the United States. Beginning in the 1980s, though, and only increasing in, the, in gravity in the years since, policy has been guided by a very different set of assumptions. Individuals are best imagined as actors within a marketplace, individually selling their labor and making consumer choices about everything from education to healthcare. Built on the fiction that everybody has the same resources and thus the same freedom to choose, to borrow a phrase from Milton Friedman, Policies increasingly revolve around the neoliberal notion that an individual's success is based solely on his or her own efforts. And there really seems to be sort of a common sense consensus around this. When we think about today's politics, in fact, um, there is on the one hand a pretty compelling argument to be made that this is the most divisive era since like the 1850s. Okay? Thankfully we don't have, uh, do I have an image of this? Thankfully we don't have anybody beating each other up on the floor of Congress. Okay. Uh, but it's pretty, it's pretty close to that, actually. Um, one party, as we know, has very recently uh, shown its willingness to shut down the government to avoid a very modest tax increase that affects only the wealthiest of Americans, or to repeal a health care policy that emanated from their own party in the 1990s. And if this nameless party is able to regain control of the Senate, the rumors are that there could be even more threats of government shutdown. So on the one hand, uh, there's, there's definitely an argument to be made that this is an incredibly divisive uh, political era. But I think there's a compelling argument to be made that these kind of knockdown, drag out fights are distracting us from a deeper ideological consensus. If we think about things like education or labor politics, for, for instance, things that fundamentally affect both economic opportunity and economic outcomes, things aren't really as contentious as they might seem, right? So, which party's president in 2011 quite literally set out the most important U.S. labor battle since at least 1981 and maybe since the 1930s? Which party's president, even in his second term, in which there are no political consequences to be suffered since he'll be leaving office regardless, has declined to even utter language about passing laws to make it more difficult for employers to resist unionization. And it's definitely not a Republican in Chicago who's shuttering dozens of community schools um, and who faces pretty overwhelming opposition from teachers and parents there. There are some outliers, right? People like Keith Ellison, um, uh, maybe my favorite uh, congressperson from Minnesota, uh, uh, arguing that uh, labor rights should be a civil right and that we should pass laws to reflect that. Or Elizabeth Warren uh, seeking a major reduction in student loan rates so the federal government doesn't turn a profit on uh, students anymore. But for all the imperfections of the nation's politics before the crises of the 70s, we don't just live in a different political time. We live in a time when the basic common sense of American politics and culture have changed dramatically. The possibilities of what the state should be doing have been dramatically limited, as has the fundamental importance of the labor movement in making Americans less susceptible to the inequality that inevitably emerges from unfettered capitalism. And beyond this, simply allowing working people in the private sector or public to have some say in their working conditions. So what I wanted to do in my research was to explain this change, uh, but not so much to answer the why as the how. Uh, the why makes sense, even if it's only circumstantial, and a lot of smarter people than me have uh, looked into this. So, uh, just to um, 
sort of give you a primer on this and maybe refresh your memories a little. The 1970s represented the perfect storm of a lot of bad things. The fruit of a, really bu uh, of a bunch of really bad foreign policy decisions were borne out by the U.S. defeat in Vietnam and the fall of Saigon, but not before billions of dollars were spent destroying North Vietnam. In the process, also undermining the U.S. budget necessary to continue and deepen the interventions of the Great Society, which had ultimately reduced poverty to its lowest level by the early 1970s, maybe ever in the United States. And, by the way, all that money was spent without raising taxes, which would have made the war even more unpopular, so this increased inflation. Inflation was made much worse by rising oil prices due to Middle Eastern oligarchs' efforts to get a larger slice of uh, oil profits. And unfortunately, all this happened at the exact same time that countries like Japan and West Germany had begun to challenge American manufacturing dominance when there are more technologically advanced industries, built in large part with Marshall Plan funds, ironically, caught up and surpassed those of the U.S. in productivity. U.S. industries became less profitable, and so companies looked to lower the price of the one input they could control. And as uh, we could debate this, but in my opinion, the only real way to add, it's Marx's opinion, but I'll, I'm not claiming it. Uh, the only real way to add surplus value in the productive process by lowering the, the cost of labor, uh, by moving operations to the global south. And if the federal government's failure to solve these difficult problems wasn't enough, the president spied on people and the CIA was busy overthrowing democratically elected governments. So in such a climate, it's pretty easy. I mean, I, I think sometimes we lose sight of, of how much sort of crisis there was at one time in the 1970s, right? In such a climate, it's not a surprise that um, uh, people's political positions would change. But there was nothing inevitable about the trajectory that it took. In fact, you could imagine uh, in the 1970s, uh, people ha assessing the situation and determining that more government, uh, more government intervention and more union protections were necessary. These things were proposed. Imagine, for example, if the Humphrey Hawkins Act, which was passed in 1978, instead of just setting targets for employment actually mandated the government as an employer of last resort. Or that the Labor Reform Act of 1977 hadn't fallen two votes short of breaking a Senate filibuster in 1978. These policies certainly would have shifted conditions more toward working people in the US. But this didn't happen, and so explaining that kind of trajectory is my project. And when I started doing preliminary research, I became, I became convinced that the question was not so much um, why did this sort of free market ideology represented by neoliberalism emerge? After all, it had been there since the uh, very beginning of uh, the New Deal. But why were the central tenets of what I call labor liberalism, the belief that the state could foster economic and social democracy, and that labor unions were central to this process, discredited in, discredited in the first place? And so when I was thinking about how to do this, I was looking at a lot of newspapers from the 1970s, just kind of fiddling around because I was so fascinated with it. And when I did, I kept coming across public sector strikes, especially teacher strikes. And this was right around the time that a really great book came out uh, by Jefferson Cowley, who's a, a, one of the sort of uh, forerunners of labor history in the 1970s, titled, as you can see here, Staying Alive. And uh, by the way, um, you can, obviously many of you know, this was a, a, a named after a you know, really famous Bee Gees song. And I kind of figure, uh, Will mentioned that um, uh, my book's under press with the University of Illinois Press. I've basically been told that I have to change the title of it. And um, given that any good book in the 1970s uh, kind of has to have a disco reference, uh, I was kind of hoping to find a way to work one into mine. Uh, the only ones I can think of so far uh, are Brick House by the Commodores, because, you know, urban schools have these sort of enormous brick structures. Um, or Earth, Wind, and Fire is September, because most teacher strikes started in September. Not really great ideas so far, so if you have anything as this the next couple of talks emerge, if any disco songs pop up that you think might be useful for me to include in the title, uh, that would be really helpful, because I think people pay attention when you've got a, a disco song to play. Um, now, Cowley was really, back to his book for a minute, not just the title, uh, was really interested in a similar question as me. Um, and he argues that culture was a really important part of what was going on in the 70s. He says, class became less important as a way to think about American politics. And Cowley makes an argument about the sort of visibility of, of labor unions. And Cowley's right that labor unions and uh, labor culture do become less visible in the 1970s, but only if you're thinking about the private sector labor movement. 
so like steel workers, auto workers, the people we think of when we think of the sort of traditional uh, unionized worker. But labor unions, I argue, didn't go anywhere in terms of American political culture in the 70s. In fact, the public image of labor basically just shifted from private sector workers to public sector workers. What I saw in the newspapers, just the sort of cursory readings of the newspapers, was that strike after strike after strike by teachers were major national news. Now, Cowley shows that attention to private sector strikes had basically started to climb by like 1974. But there were a lot of teacher strikes in the 1970s. Uh, by one estimate, there were 241 in 1975 alone. But what was most amazing to me about these strikes is that because of economic crisis, right, so cities were especially hit hard by inflation and the economic downturn, some of these strikes were extremely long. And because they were so long and so heated, the discussion that took place in the public sphere, in the media, in board, school board meetings, things like this, became a site in which the public narrative about labor unions and liberalism shifted, sometimes dramatically over the course of just a few weeks or, or a couple of months. And I argue that these discussions really centered around two problems endemic to the kind of particular form of labor, labor liberalism that emerged in the post-war US. Two problems that were uh, really, really intractable. So first, <coughs> excuse me, New Deal labor law, that is private sector labor law, did not, and as many of you know, still does not, apply to government workers. Um, so this is from the Wagner Act, 1935. This is just the specific language. The term employer does not include um, the U.S., any, hold, any wholly owned government corporation, Federal Reserve Bank, or importantly, any state or political subdivision uh, thereof. Um, so uh, workers, private, public sector workers didn't have the right to strike as, they, uh, as, as uh, anyone employed in the private sector does uh, under the Wagner Act. But, but, but government workers went on strike anyway, right? So it became a kind of practical problem of uh, how to deal with them, right? So when they went on strike, most states had laws that prevented them from striking, and uh, thus when they struck, they did so illegally. But enforcing the law was really difficult because it's pretty much impossible to like fire and rehire 20,000 teachers or 30,000 teachers in some of the really big cities. New York, New York City in the 70s had like 60,000 teachers. Uh, and so, since by the 1970s, public workers, especially teachers, increasingly represented the prism through which many Americans understood the labor movement, the failure by the state to prevent lengthy stoppages of education helped to undermine the public's confidence in labor liberalism. The second tension stemmed from the spatialization and racialization of poverty in the nation's urban areas. As a really uh, uh, enormously uh, important historical literature in the past couple of decades has documented, New Deal housing and transportation policy privileged whites in the housing market, union, manuf union manufacturing jobs moved to all white suburbs, and many African Americans were left in segregated neighborhoods and inner cities with far fewer economic opportunities and a shrinking tax base there to pay for necessary urban services like schools. The conditions leading teachers to strike represented in, in, in part the fruition of policies that concentrated poverty in cities and helped to cause massive budget deficits in the 1970s. Teacher strikes thus exposed a federalist framework incapable or unwilling to use metropolitan or national solutions to rectify urban-suburban structural inequalities. So, Though the labor liberal state failed in a number of ways during the 1970s, uh, the state's failure to, if we think of it this way, solve teacher strikes serves as a previously little examined way that the political post-war consensus was undermined during the 70s. And teachers, as representatives of both the state and the labor movement, by striking illegally and appearing to put their own needs above uh, their, their students or the desires of taxpayers, some of whom themselves belong to private sector unions, also signified a growing sense in the American cultural narrative that those things that had made America prosper, like hard work, respect for law and order, entrepreneurialism, were falling by the wayside. So what, what my research does is it, it examines case studies of the most prominent labor conflicts that shut down urban schools during the 70s. Uh, my treatment of these strikes shows how, on a day-to-day -day level, ideological support for labor liberalism uh, became undermined, paving the way for a new neoliberal politics that would privilege individuals' actions in the marketplace over social guarantees of wages 
and working conditions. So I obviously can't talk about every teacher strike in the 1970s, uh, but for the rest of the lecture today, I'm going to focus on the case of Philadelphia to show how teacher strikes really highlighted some of the major tensions of the 70s, uh, but more importantly, how the specific trajectory um, in one city changed over, a, 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 over a, a, both a short period of time and over a sort of longer period of a decade. Tomorrow we're going to look at how anti-union forces mobilized to shape public opinion around the same time and then capitalized on this kind of discredited set of political ideals to push Americans toward consent for neoliberal policies. Okay, so my premise here is that the New Deal and then the two decades after World War II brought a more or less political consensus around an idea called labor liberalism. Basically, in response to the Great Depression and the seeming failure of market capitalism, this meant a combination of the Keynesian notion that the state should play a role in ensuring demand for consumer products, uh, with the belief that for the economy to function properly, wealth needed to be redis redistribu uh, redistributed, and that labor unions were integral in the process. Read the first paragraph of the Wagner Act sometimes, and you'll, sometime you'll see that in there. Uh, also, a permanent welfare state would provide Americans some level of security against all the bad things that are caused by capitalism's instability, such as unemployment. Okay, so where do public sectors and thus teachers fit into this? Well, as most of us know, the, the state grew dramatically during the New Deal and the post-war era. Uh, there were major increases in spending and thus jobs uh, on the federal, state, and local level. And uh, this shows this, um, this chart here shows this in, in, uh, pr pretty well. Uh, you can see a major expansion in, in state spending um, uh, during World War II. But then, you know, sort of a continual increase in spending uh, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And just to put this in terms of one sector, so here's education spending um, over roughly the same time period. And you can see this enormous increase uh, especially after World War II, um, mostly local spending, but increasingly state, and then, of course, some small trickle, uh, comparatively, of federal spending over the same time period. And so, while you have this expansion of the state, you have public sector workers looking at what private sector workers are doing and seeing how successful they are in organizing. Uh, inspiring them to consider the possibilities that collective bargaining could bring. For teachers, many of whom came from working families and had viewed teaching as sort of a way into the middle class, unionization offered the promise of higher wages and better working conditions. And in fact, public sector unionization grew dramatically in the U.S. in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So much so that I would argue that the, the dramatic expansion of public sector organization in some ways obscures the narrative we have of labor unions after World War II. Let me show you what I mean by this. All right. This shows union membership uh, in the United States, and it breaks it down, as you can see here, by public and private uh, membership. Um, the high watermark of unionization in the US was about 1953, oh, I can use that, um, uh, when the rate uh, was about 33% overall. And you can see that for the private sector, uh, that's also kind of the high watermark. Right? Um, somewhere around 37, 38% of workers, uh, private sector workers belong to unions in 1953. But take a look at this line, right? There's a decline in uh, private sector unionization rates even before, I think a lot of people sort of have this notion that uh, unionization starts to decline in the, private, in the private sector really rapidly when, I don't know, something strange happened in 1981, I don't know what it was. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, but you can see that it's actually sort of a, a, a continuing trend of a lot of things that are already happening. What, what is obscuring the sort of overall trend of unionization uh, in the United States is this dramatic increase of public sector unionization that starts in the 60s and, and continues into the 70s. Uh, I'll just give you some numbers here. From 1953 to 83, the number of public sector workers and unions increased seven times from about 770,000 to 5.4 million. And union density in the public sector increased from 12% in 1953 to 40% by 1974, kind of tapering off to 34% by the third year of the Reagan presidency in 83. <coughs> Teachers were an extremely important part of this unionization effort, and in fact, uh, some of the most vocal. And it took strikes, or at least the threat of it, 
virtually all of these against the law, to get local, to get local officials to agree to collectively bargain uh, with teachers. So here's just a, uh, an image. Um, this is from a one-day teacher strike in 1960. Uh, this man in the middle here is, if you don't know, is David Selden, who was an uh, organizer um, for the United Federation of Teachers, and then would go on to become president of the AFT. You can see it was still cool to smoke cigarettes on the picket line back in 1960. And bow ties. And a bow tie, yes. Um, uh, Selden actually, um, uh, at one point, was a, a served almost 60 days in prison uh, during a, another teacher strike in Newark uh, for violating injunction, um, but uh, we can talk about that later. John, can I interrupt you yeah. about the previous slide? What, can you go back to it? No, that, what is that year in the 1970s where there's a, sh there's a, a sharp turn in both the um, private and public sector? There's a downturn. Right here? Yeah. Um, Like 76, maybe? Yeah, that, my guess is that is after the New York City fiscal crisis. Um, so but it's we, also private sector takes a sharp turn, too. Not as dramatic. Okay. Yeah, I'm not, sh I'm not sure. Um, my guess is it's due to, you know, sort of economic uh, downturn, but I don't know specifically what would have happened in 1976. Uh, maybe we can talk about that. Um, Sorry for the answer. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. Anybody has any <coughs> questions, go ahead and ask. Curious, um, this, yeah? Wasn't it mostly women, even at that time, who were teachers? That's right. Um, something like, um, uh, I think now about 75% of the teaching force in the United States is, is female. Um, uh, in the early 60s, uh, because of the kind of uh, higher salaries and the, and the slightly more prestige of teaching after World War II, uh, I think those numbers went down to about 60, you know, 62, 63 percent female. So there was a larger amount of men uh, in the teaching force. So yeah, if anybody has any questions at any time, just interrupt me. Um, okay. So um, uh, there was this one-day strike in 1960. Uh, it was timed uh, right before um, uh, the presidential election, and um, actually worked pretty well. It convinced uh, uh, the, the mayor, uh, who was. Uh, Robert Wagner's son, uh, Robert Wagner Jr., obviously, um, uh, to bargain with teachers. So this was a really kind of pioneering um, moment. And uh, so sort of, uh, uh, well actually, uh, the, the first contract wasn't signed in 1960, just as a clarification. Um, but over the 1960s and 70s, there were a lot of representation elections won um, and a lot of uh, collective bargaining contracts signed by teachers. So just to give you one statistic here. In 1961, there were only 12 collective bargaining contracts in the entire US for, for teachers. By 1980, around 75% of the teachers in the US worked under some form of collective bargaining agreement. And the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers was one of the first to follow on the heels of New York City in 1965. So in 1965, New York and Detroit are kind of the second wave of, of uh, teachers to get uh, contracts. Uh, Chicago was another big city pioneer in 1967. Now, as in other big cities, uh, by the early 1970s, teachers in Philly had seen a, a dramatic increase in wages as a result of unionization and collective bargaining, in addition to better working conditions. So less sort of arbitrarily being assigned uh, to uh, uh, supervisory duties and things like this. But by the early 70s, uh, when you combine uh, the increase in spending on education with declining property tax revenues, uh, result to the fact that decades of federal housing and transportation policy had practically pushed both white Philadelphians and jobs into mostly white suburbs and surrounding areas like Bucks County. Philly schools faced a serious budget problem. And in fact, if you've been following what's been going on in Philadelphia now, you know that uh, uh, it's a sort of pretty similar situation. In fact, we could play a really fun game, if it weren't so morbid, uh, which is, which one of these quotes are from the 1970s and which is from 2014? Anybody want to guess? There's one thing that might give it away. If you know who the superintendent of Philadelphia schools were, either in 1970 or 2014. This one's, this one's uh, 2014. This was uh, uh, right before school opened. And this one is from 1970. <laughs> so, uh, kind of depressing, actually. Um, Progress. 
Um, but schools, um, in spite of the fear, and I think this was in February 1970, the fear that Philadelphia was on the verge of uh, falling, uh, the verge of collapse, schools did open on time um, every year in the early 1970s. Um, as they did this year, uh, with lots of cuts, although if you're a, a student in Philadelphia in the public schools this year, don't expect to have, to have, to have those luxury, luxurious things like guidance counselors or school nurses, you know, those things that uh, students typically don't need anyway, right? Um, but the massive deficit by 1972-73 in Philly caused banks to stop lending money uh, to the school board unless they agreed to balance their budget. And what's interesting is that uh, to, you know, what's interesting about this is that um, uh, much of the commentary on the strike uh, didn't simply assume, as it does now, that teachers should basically just bear the brunt of whatever fiscal difficulties there were. Right. So again, if you've been following Philadelphia, you know that the School Reform Commission there basically just unilaterally cancel the teachers' contract, and it'll, it'll probably be a uh, challenge in the courts, uh, uh, hopefully successfully. Um, uh, and it, there was also not an assumption that there had to be some sort of terribly regressive way to solve the fiscal crisis, right? So the other thing that's happening in Philadelphia now is uh, the city council just passed a $2 a pack uh, cigarette tax increase. Hardly something that's going to revolutionize the way income is redistributed in the city. Most of the local newspapers in 1972-73, though, most, most, most of the local discussion, uh, in fact, um, called on the state of Pennsylvania to kick in more money for the schools. Uh, the higher salaries paid to teachers in the city, um, argued the Philadelphia Inquirer, the most, um, the largest newspaper uh, in 1972-73, uh, argued that this was a difficulty that wasn't faced by suburban and rural districts, which could rely on getting a larger portion of their funds from the state of Pennsylvania. Compared to other major cities, in fact, uh, the salaries of Philadelphia teachers uh, were hardly excessive. Uh, Philadelphia teacher salaries, as I've said, certainly increased dramatically, uh, but starting salaries for teachers in Philly were lower than in comparable cities like Chicago, Washington, D.C., and Detroit, and just a bit higher than cities like Baltimore and Cleveland. Still, facing a major debt, the school board, who, interestingly, this is kind of interesting, whose chairman was a vice, or who, the chairman of the school board was a vice president of the local a the Philadelphia AFL-CIO. Uh, he was a, a he was a, uh, on the executive council of the International uh, Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. <laughs> Sought the teachers to take con concessions when their contract expired in August 1972. So they called for eliminating 500 jobs, a longer school day, and wage freezes. And now remember, this is a time in which uh, Nixon had clamped down on inflation a little bit by um, uh, instituting wage and price controls. But everybody, I think, kind of knew that once those were lifted, inflation was going to sort of ramp back up again. Teachers felt like they had no choice but to strike. And so each side, the board and teachers, dug in for three weeks in September. And then, following a period in which the board allowed teachers to work under the previous contract, teachers went out again the next January and would stay out for almost two months, an additional two months. So here's an image of the Philadelphia teachers on strike. Uh, you can tell how they're dressed. It's, if there were more snow on the ground, it might be a Wisconsin kind of thing, but there's not enough snow. But you can tell it's uh, January in, in Philadelphia. Um, that meant that the school system was shut down for a total of three months in 1972-73. Now, teacher strikes by 1972 were nothing new in the United States, as I've already mentioned. There were a lot of teacher strikes in the 60s and early 70s. Um, beginning with that one-day UFT strike in 1960, there were 300 teacher strikes in, in, over the course of the 1960s, and 105 alone in 1967. But most of these strikes were pretty short, and in fact, uh, the only two that were really lengthy before Philadelphia um, were two uh, urban strikes, two uh, strikes in urban areas. The take that slide out. Uh, the first in uh, Brooklyn, New York in 1968, in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, which some of you probably know something about, in which uh, an attempt by a small, uh, largely African-American school district to assert community control over personnel decisions clashed against what the UFT perceived as a defense of due process rights. Uh, 
Uh, so here's an image of, uh, obviously this is uh, Albert Shanker with Bayard Rustin. And in 1970, 71, there were, there were uh, in, in both school years, there were two really contentious strikes in Newark, resulting in the head of the AFT, David Selden, in prison for, he was sentenced to 60 days, he actually served about 45. Um, like Ocean Hill Brownsville, pitting an African American community, in this case led by Amiri Baraka's uh, Black Power Movement in the city, against the mostly white teaching force. And here is uh, Selden, now uh, not smoking this time, maybe he quit, I don't know, uh, but uh, holding a placard, and then here he is being uh, carried into one of those really cool 1970s style uh, paddy wagons. Um, but the Philly strike was really reminiscent of a new kind of teacher strike. A strike in which fiscal crisis, or at least the perception of it, led to local politicians willing to play a long game to kind of reduce costs. In fact, we could call these sort of, uh, to borrow the title from a, a recent book, uh, strikes against austerity. And in striking, uh, teachers were on the wrong side of the law in virtually every case. This led to a situation in which a public conversation, which often had, in many different situations, uh, which often had a place for a pretty in-depth discussion of American uh, metropolitan political economy, instead focused on the misdeeds of unionized teachers. As representatives of, of both unions and the state, the crisis of striking teachers in turn led many Americans to question the legitimacy of both things. Now the Philly strike was especially important as a national model because of how state intervention in Pennsylvania had been uh, really intimately tie tied to the unionization of public employees. Pennsylvania had passed a law in that, just in 1970. It was one of the most far-reaching labor laws in the United States. Um, interestingly, this, this law, uh, which gave public sector workers the right to collectively bargain and the right to strike, and I'll talk about the limits of that in a second, was passed by a Republican legislature, Republican State Senate, the House wasn't uh, uh, Republican, and signed into law by a Republican governor. So obviously a slightly different uh, Republican in charge of Pennsylvania than the one who's in charge now. Um, the act, it's really interesting logic, the act actually hoped to make strikes less frequent by giving public sector workers the right to strike. Um, the logic was that if teachers could, could strike only after exhausting other sort of extensive bargaining procedures, they would then only strike when the public believed the local government was being recalcitrant. And this would then force the government to basically act justly, which would cut down on strikes. Uh, kind of circuitous logic. Um, this is uh, from the commission that was uh, commissioned uh, by the governor in 1968 to study the, the, the problem. Uh, it, basically, the, the law was almost, almost copied from the, uh, the commission report. And you can see the language here. In short, we look upon the limited right to strike as a safety valve that will, in fact, prevent strikes. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but uh, this was sort of a national model because of the idea that look at what Pennsylvania is doing. They're giving teachers the right to strike. Let's see if it actually works in, in giving sort of labor peace. Okay, so what, again, what's really instructive about this strike is that, in the early, in, in, is that early on, so in 1972 and early 73, before the strike was criminalized, and I'll talk about how that happens in a second, a really vibrant discussion played out in Philly in which teachers, politicians, parents, and newspaper editors debated the deficiencies inherent in the structure of the metropolitan school system. The Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, for, for example, in an editorial published in the newspaper, argued that the teacher strike, and I'm quoting, merely compounded an existing crisis, end quote, and called, the Chamber of Commerce, called for an increase in the city's business tax to support the schools, right? A very far cry from today's National Chamber of Commerce. <coughs> which I believe spent about $100 million uh, in 2012 to influence uh, elections. The city's largest newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, again, uh, endorsed a suburban newspaper's metropolitan solution, which had asked to um, basically reorganize the entire metropolitan area, asking, as you can see here, when will we recognize the interdependence of the city and the suburbs? If the city dies, we will go with it, make no mistake. And even the really kind of bristly uh, mayor, Frank Rizzo, who was an inherent of law and order, some of you may have heard this term before, uh, originating before the popular TV show. Um, he, as you can see here, sort of scoffed at the outrageous demands of teachers. Even Rizzo went to the president 
who at the time was Nixon, uh, and, and ended up scoring $10 million for teacher salaries, and a sort of tacit admission of the, the problems of the schools there. It was not just elites either who tried to influence the debate, who tried to, to make larger claims about how a metropolitan political economy should be organized. So uh, Jay Shikar, who wrote a letter to the editor uh, of the other Philadelphia newspaper, The Bulletin, uh, in 1972, as you can see here, argued that the Vietnam War should be ended and those resources reallocated to uh, uh, urban schools. Uh, let's come back to that in a minute. Uh, Peggy DeFinis, who is from the white working class northeastern section of the city, so the part of the city where there was really the most resistance to taxes and most resistance to paying for schools. Um, so I don't know how well uh, all of you know Philadelphia, but this kind of this area here, um, jutting out into the, the suburbs. So she's from that area. Admitted that she hated paying taxes as much as anyone else. But she also recognized that the city, because of the challenges of servicing so many students, needed additional schools, and as you can see here, needed to, she didn't say need twice, that's a typo, uh, needed to make salaries for teachers attractive enough that they'll put up with overcrowded conditions in the existing classrooms. <clears throat> I think our children need and deserve an education, and I don't think I'm alone in saying that I'm willing to pay for it. Now, I don't want to overstate things here. Many Philadelphians certainly saw the state as excessive, particularly in terms of the racial politics of the early 1970s. There was no busing in Philadelphia as there had been as a solution to segregation in many other northern cities, but there was still a discourse about the sort of supposed excesses of the civil rights movement. And in fact, Rizzo had made his political name for himself as police commissioner, uh, leading a major crackdown against black power activism in the city in the late 60s. Um, and so there's certainly evidence of this kind of discussion uh, in the strike. So for example, a woman uh, named Mrs. Michael Sullivan, also from Northeastern Philly, uh, also supporting a tax increase, but did so, come back to that in a second, did so only on the condition that, quote, it included all the sections of the city, including a tax on apartment dwellers, because they have children attending school too, end quote. If the, if the sort of racial coding of apartment dwellers as opposed to the white property owners in, white, uh, in northeastern Philly was not entirely explicit, um, a quote from J.E. Blatch, who basically wrote this on a questionnaire at a home and school council meeting, which is basically in Philadelphia, it's just another way of saying PTA, uh, made this really unambiguous. The northeast pays enough taxes and gets little in return. Our taxes are supporting the ghetto areas. The key point, though, is that a really vibrant discussion took place about the political economy of the city with a lot of different proposed solutions during the first half of the 72-73 school year. However, even though many Philadelphians uh, believe that the teacher strikes open up the possibility of more far-reaching interventions from the state of Pennsylvania, or even from the federal government, the teachers who struck did so illegally. All right? and so back to that law for just a second. It was legal for teachers to strike but the strike could be enjoined when it violated the health, safety, or welfare of the public. And what that meant in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, it was uh, essentially defined through case law, um, was the point at which this, this, the schools would begin to lose state funds if they could not furnish a complete school year to students, and that was 180 days. So as the strike started to threaten that 180-day threshold, uh, the uh, local judge enjoined the strike, so making it a legal order, uh, teachers back to work. And the, the union's president, a man named Frank Sullivan, and chief negotiator John Ryan were convicted of contempt of court and sentenced to six month prison terms. Kind of a weird idea to put people in prison when you're trying to negotiate with them, but that was the logic. These actions, I argue, shifted the debate to one after criminalizing the strike, it fo focused almost exclusively on the moral turpitude of the teachers. So, again, at the beginning of the strike, there were not really a lot of serious voices in the media who were anti-teacher or anti-union, even in the public sector. Most mainstream newspaper reporters and, uh, and television and radio news commentators accepted the basic legitimacy of labor unions, even in the public sector, though sort of grudgingly. But as the, as the uh, criminalization of striking teachers uh, drove the narrative in the media toward it, uh, excuse me, uh, 
The criminalization of striking teachers in each case drove the narrative in the media and among public commentators toward a discussion of the teacher's transgressions and the city's impotence toward its own workforce. So for example, here's a TV editorial uh, from uh, January 18th, WCAU TV, which is the local CBS affiliate. Um, this was right after the injunction was levied. So the teachers weren't in prison yet, the local leaders, but the, the, the strike had been enjoined. You can see what, what kind of teacher is it who teaches by personal example, open defiance of the law. The discussion after the teachers were punished, so a couple weeks later, also opened up to questions of culture, morals, and what the bigger role of labor unions should be in the United States. So here's another letter to the, to the editor uh, from Harry Holt Smith, um, um, arguing that years ago, the unions, I'm sure some of us have heard this argument before, Years ago, the unions did a lot of good for the working man, but in recent years, a vicious circle has developed, not only hurting the US, but the entire world. Where are the dedicated teachers, doctors, etc.? Not sure what kind of experience this guy had with his doctor, but you get the idea here. Um, the salary demands of the teachers also became the sole explanation for the school's financial difficulties, right? So at the, we're talking about structure at the very beginning of the strike. By the end, we're talking about uh, um, teacher salaries. So here's an example of this. This is a letter that was actually written to the president of, of the AFT while he was uh, in jail, uh, arguing that the cost of our public employees is getting to the breaking point. The city is emptying of its productive citizens who pay the bills. Soon there will be nothing left but white Catholics and parish schools who have it tough enough already and helpless blacks. We are almost to that point now. Okay, so commentary like this shows that the framing of the strike moved dramatically over the course of the six month long battle. All right. Again, much of the discourse around the strike uh, initially assumed that teachers deserve collective bargaining rights, sometimes even including the right to strike. It focused on solutions to the crisis. But once the strike was criminalized, uh, the perceived inability of the state to control its own labor force led to a very different meaning of, what, of, of, uh, of the strike, which focused on the declining legitimacy of both the labor movement and the liberal policy designed to prevent disruption in the state's ability to provide public services. So in really, really broad terms then, post-war liberalism didn't have answers for contradictions of its own making. The Democratic Party brought private sector labor unions into its fold through the Wagner Act, giving those workers the right to organize and the right to strike, but its relationship to the public sector was always kind of ambivalent. State and local governments kept po public sector workers at arm's length, sometimes supporting rights to bargain and sometimes resenting the loss of control that resulted from such a concession and public sector unions always re remained in a sort of liminal legal and political space. Teachers, as we've seen, were often allowed to form unions and bargain collectively, but they were repeatedly warned against using the primary leverage at their disposal, the right to strike, in order to improve their negotiating power. New Deal liberalism never quite answered the question of what the role of teachers among other employee, public employees should be. Were they employees whose rights in the workplace were paramount? or employees whose primary obligation was to provide services to the public. This was a contradiction that was always at the heart of New Deal liberalism, I argue, um, uh, which promised both positive state action and labor rights. The neoliberal political networks that emerged in the 70s, though, had a really easy answer to this problem. Okay, so neoliberalism, which uh, I'm uh, just cheating and just gonna go ahead and use David Harvey because he's usually right about everything. Um, use his definition. This neoliberalism squarely asserted that teachers were employees whose primary obligation was to provide the services for which they were hired. And if they didn't like it, they could get a job somewhere else. And increasingly, those services were reducible uh, to teaching quantifiable skills desired by employers. And I'm sure we're familiar with that phenomenon. Okay, so to understand this phenomenon of neoliberalism a bit more, and I'm going to come back to a second Philadelphia strike in just a second. Let's take a minute to discuss one of my favorite historical figures. Milton Friedman, the intellectual architect of neoliberalism. Uh, as I colloquially refer to him, and other people have used this, but uh, I often refer to him in my lectures as Uncle Milty. Um, Friedman, of course, did not like the term neoliberalism, and in fact liked to call himself a liberal, as he saw his project as part of the kind of liberal free market tradition of Adam Smith. So this is from Capitalism and Freedom in 1962. Uh, and you can see here, he says, our, our project as uh, liberals 
is uh, to go back to the sort of radical tradition of, of Adam Smith and uh, the free market, uh, politi really political economy uh, of the early, the late uh, 1700s and early 1800s. But Smith's neoliberalism, at least I think, and this is something I'm still kind of working out, so uh, I'd be welcome to hear anything you have to say about this, went beyond Smith's argument that the state should just allow individual competition to drive economic development. Friedman really has been the prophet of an even further reach of the market, in which the state actively carves market opportunities out of social goods like education, funneling public funds into private profits. Um, so this is again from Capitalism and Freedom, and I just want to highlight this one part here. Um, so what I see as going beyond Smith is this, not just uh, enforcing private contracts, but now fostering competitive markets, making markets where they didn't exist before. Now, Friedman's view of education, in fact, is quite instructive. And I'll just talk for a minute about this. His most important work, uh, and I, I would argue, Friedman's most important single work in terms of uh, public visibility, was the 1980 uh, 10-part PBS series, Free to Choose. Uh, he, he sort of uh, was able to, to get it produced because he had just won the Nobel Prize in economics in 1976, I believe. Maybe that's why all of a sudden uh, union, unionization dropped that year. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, 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 so he uses that to kind of create this PBS series, which actually is pretty interesting. It actually wasn't funded by PBS. It was funded in large part by the uh, Richard Mellon Scaife Foundation. Uh, and then PBS, it was funded by a local PBS affiliate, but then aired uh, by the, by, everywhere by PBS in 1980. And what it was was essentially a 10-part argument about why the free market should be unleashed in the United States. <coughs> part six is the one that I've spent the most time looking at because it's the one about education. Uh, in part six, Freeman, Friedman argued that fostering market competition in education would allow parents more freedom and overall better educational outcomes. So here he is. This is, uh, I don't know if any of you have actually watched any of this. If you've watched all ten parts, good for you. Uh, the way that the format of the show worked is there was a 30-minute segment where Friedman, it was, it was a lot of footage of different things, and Friedman would narrate it. And then the second part was kind of an open forum with various luminaries of the day. So uh, the episode on education actually has Friedman sparring with Albert Shanker at one point. Uh, but so where he kind of concludes in that first part is to say that market competition is the surest way to improve the quality and promote innovation in education as in every other field. Friedman's segment on education specifically criticized teachers' unions for keeping the market from doing its job and holding back the nation's education system. And as I said, he sparred with Albert Shanker during the segment, um, where Shanker really presently actually uh, argued in, that in a market-based system, the best students would be spirited away to better schools, and the public schools would decline as a result. And I think uh, we can debate this, but I think we've seen some evidence of that in a lot of school districts in the U.S. So the Philly strike in 72-73 was one in which there was a really vigorous debate about the political economy of Philly, but free to choose showed how neoliberals like Friedman were trying to shift this debate. Forget about getting the state to equalize education. Instead, students are consumers, market actors who don't have a right to a good education unless their parents make the right choice. And even though he didn't discuss private profit and free to choose, there's certainly no reason private companies can't compete for students and make profits. After all, if students are consumers, why can't someone make money off of them? And if you've read uh, Diane Ravitch's new book, uh, uh, Reign of Error, uh, there's uh, lots of discussions of uh, for-profit charter companies making money off of, making quite lucrative uh, amounts of money off of, uh, from public education dollars. The weirdest one, um, I, can't, I can't remember if it's in the book or if I just you know, read an article about this, but the weirdest one is in Ohio, I think, where uh, a for-profit charter company right now and the state of Ohio are arguing over who the furniture in the school, paid for all with public funds, who the furniture in the school belongs to because the school went defunct, right? Kind of interesting. Um, Friedman also points out in Free to Choose how unionized teachers are responsible for stifling innovation. The implication being that unions, which purposely take individuals out of the competitive marketplace to bargain collectively, should be tamed if not eliminated. And so here's what he says. I was going to show you the clip, but we don't have enough time. Um, so talking about teachers, he, he uh, was examining a, a, a teacher's uh, union in uh, England. And he says, um, 
parents would be given, okay, for, for four years there have been efforts here to introduce an experiment in greater parental choice. Parents would be given vouchers covering the cost of schooling. And I can't really do his Uncle Melty voice, but try to picture him saying it in that voice if you've ever heard him speak. They could use the voucher to send their child to any school of their choice. I have long believed that children, teachers, all of us would benefit from a voucher system, but the headmaster here, who happens also to be secretary of the local teachers union, has very different views about introducing vouchers. End of the quote. I point to free to choose because Friedman's ideas would figure really prominently in the Philadelphia in the, in the, the Philadelphia strike I'm going to discuss in a second in 1981, and what would basically be the last really long teacher strike in the United States. Okay. Uh, anybody know how long the Chicago teacher strike was in, in uh, uh, 2012? Seven days. Seven days. It was, yeah, it was a very short period. I mean, it, there was a lot of ink spilled about it, but it was a very short period of time. The Philadelphia strike in 1981 lasted 50 days, 50 days of, of school mist, and actually led the AFL-CIO there to call a general strike. Um, it was called, it was actually, the, the teachers were ordered back to work at the last minute. That's the only way the general strike was averted. In September 1981, in the discussion about that strike, though, many in the public had begin, had begun to embrace Friedman's ideas, even using the same verbiage, uh, openly questioning the viability of the city's public school system. All right? Now, from the end of the Philly strike uh, in 1973 until 1981, the nation had seen its share of lengthy urban teacher strikes largely revolving around fiscal crisis. Uh, oh, there he is in uh, Free to Choose. This is the last scene where he's in front of a one-room schoolhouse. I really recommend watching this. It's, it's, it's quite, um, quite entertaining. Um, in Baltimore, there was a, a one-month strike in 1974. In New York City, I'll give you the PowerPoint. This is a direct link to episode six. Just my little plug. Uh, in 1975, there was a week-long teacher strike following the New York City fiscal crisis, right? This sort of famous image many of us probably know from the New York Daily News. Um, in Pittsburgh, in 1975-76, there was a two-month teacher strike. In St. Louis, in 1979, there was a two-month teacher strike. So another strike in Philly seemed to kind of just, uh, on some level, show how mundane urban education crisis had become in the 1970s. All right, but so what happened in, in, um, by the end of the decade, by the end of the 70s in Philadelphia, was there was still an enormous budget deficit. Teachers agreed to a major concession in bargaining for the 1980 contract, foregoing pay raises in the first year of the deal in exchange for a 10% increase um, in the second year of the deal. Now, remember, inflation is double digits, right? This is, this is uh, right at the time when the uh, uh, Volcker is trying to you know, uh, raise interest rates to ring out inflation. Um, and the other thing that the, uh, the teachers did was they gave the school board more discretion in uh, laying off teachers. By 1981, however, a whole lot had changed, right? President, uh, Ronald Reagan becomes president by a landslide, um, and uh, by August 1981, this is when he's uh, fired the Pat co-workers. So very much sort of symbol symbolizing to people that a new era of labor relations had been sort of firmly entrenched in the U.S. And just days before the teacher strike in 1981, President Reagan's Secretary of Education, Terrell Bell, citing his concern about the widespread public perception that something is seriously remiss in our public school system, end quote, commissioned a panel to study the state of education in the U.S. This commission ended up publishing the report A Nation at Risk, which was published in 1983. But in 1981, the very commissioning of the report signified a growing uh, notion that the nation's school system was dysfunctional. Okay, so the mayor at the time, in this context, uh, is a Democrat named William Green. And uh, I'll come back to him in a minute. Uh, eerily, he's the father of the current head of the Philadelphia School Reform Commission, who unilaterally canceled the Philadelphia teacher's contract last week. Uh, so here's William Green, a Democrat, all right, Democratic mayor. Uh, here's his son, William Green IV, who was a city council member and now the head of the School Reform Commission also a Democrat. Um, the older Green uh, provoked the strike by asking teachers to forego the raise that had been bargained into their contract. Uh, and, and, and explicitly, I keep doing that, uh, explicitly uh, linking it to concession bargaining in the private sector. 
right? And you can see from this quote that he specifically references Chrysler and the concessions that auto workers had made uh, in exchange for a bailout from the Carter administration. But tellingly, in the strike in 1981, in this new era of municipal political economy that had dawned after the New York City Austerity Program and the California Tax Revolt in 1978, Older Green didn't even bother to publicly ask for more funds from the state of Pennsylvania or the federal government, where the Reagan administration's new budget was projected to cut $17 million a year and actually would end up doing more than that for Philadelphia schools. In this context, the public discussion basically focused on whether or not the schools were worth saving at all. And several people embraced Friedman's assumptions about how schools should properly be run. So just give you a couple of examples of this. Um, so here's a letter from Carol Aff to the mayor, uh, September 1981. Those of us who pay taxes, basically this is, uh, she starts off by saying, I'm tired of people talking about how the children are important. Real kind of curmudgeonly. <laughs> Those of us who pay taxes are more important. We're more important than the kids who don't want to go to school and learn anything anyway. Education is a business, and people with business backgrounds should be running the show. Or here's Gerald Pal Palladino in a letter to the Philadelphia Bulletin, who specifically referenced uh, Friedman and Frida Chu's and said, we need a voucher scheme. Under a voucher scheme, the school, school system would have to compete. Those not measuring up to the standards of the people desiring education will fail, as they should or maybe even the starkest call for all, uh, of, of them all from D.B. Stad. Let's get on with concrete plans for a voucher system and financial support for alternative schools as soon as possible. Okay, so we know that neoliberals have not always got their way in pushing these notions, right? There's been a lot of uh, contesting of these ideas. Market-based reforms continue um, to be seriously challenged. Certainly, charters have been expanded dramatically and are at least in part responsible for whatever good they do, and we can debate that, for today's fiscal problems in Philadelphia. The school vouchers still represent a mostly experimental idea that has not been instituted in very many places, as, some, as I'm sure most of you know, Milwaukee is one of the few places that's been successfully experimented with. And I mean institute, I don't mean successful, you know, you know what I'm saying. The, but the obvious political benefit of, the, of these answers to the problems of the 1970s is that they're straightforward, easy to understand solutions, as opposed to the more complicated efforts to figure out whether it may or may not be appropriate for unionized teachers to shut down the school system, or how to ensure that property tax revenues are distributed equally, or even whether property taxes should be the way we fund schools predominantly in the United States you know, at, at all. The point is, though, by the early 1980s, the ideas of neoliberalism, neoliberals like Friedman, were increasingly guiding the debate. The common sense of the US political mainstream was shifting away from faith in a public policy with labor unions at the center toward private provision of social goods like education. So, all right, with that, I'll open it up to any questions that you might have. I just want to take the opportunity to do something I was supposed to do at the beginning, which is to just remind you that John's giving two more. He's giving another lecture uh, tomorrow uh, entitled Compulsory Unionism in, in the Public Sector. Um, this sort of focuses more on the sort of attack side of um, this uh, study. Uh, it's tomorrow at 4 p.m. in Social Sciences 8417. Um, and then on Thursday, he'll be uh, in a, a seminar. Uh, at 1220, uh, that's in Social Science 8108. There's, uh, there's reading that, that you can do uh, on, for, on the web that's posted on the Haven Center website. So do you want to handle questions? Sure. Is it, yeah. uh, and I'll also just point out that the, the lecture tomorrow is going to be connecting develop, developments in the 1970s to the uh, Supreme Court case decision over the summer, Harris versus Quinn. So we'll be connecting it um, uh, to sort of contemporary uh, discussions about labor unions. Yeah. Well, I, I, so if so, if, public, if private um, sector unions had not been on the decline in this period, do you think um, the debate about public sector teachers would have been as successful? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to. I, I I found your argument really compelling, but I'm trying to understand, like. Um, whether it's because there's public, they, they, sh they, they should be dedicated, they serve the public, 
they should be intrinsically motivated. They shouldn't be, you know, abandoning our kids and going for higher wages. So even even with the cities, like being in fiscal crisis, suppose there were really strong <laughs> private sector unions. Could it could they have gotten away with that kind of? Yeah, I, I, I think it would be more difficult. I, I do think one of the challenges, and this is something I'm, I'm trying to work out in this project, is how private and public sector unions fit together in the United States. So um, I think on a very kind of uh, pro forma level, public, uh, private sector unions very much supported public sector unions, right? Like the, the, AF, the uh, general strike in 19, the threat of the general strike in 1981 in Philadelphia, which uh, has, still had a really a pretty robust uh, unionized private sector uh, at that time. But I think there um, is some disconnect between that kind of, there was some disconnect between that kind of rhetoric and the support on the ground for public sector unions. And I, and I think that's something I want to examine a bit more, uh, but also something I think we need to talk about now in terms of uh, where the labor movement is and where it's going. So for example, the, the general strike that I was talking about, uh, it's also the case that uh, there were a lot of murmurings that a lot of uh, uh, private sector workers might not actually turn out for that strike. The idea, there was some grumbling like, well, you know, th these people make more money than us. Why are we, why are we striking to, you know, kind of, why are we demonstrating to kind of protect them? So I think there's kind of a disconnect. I also think that the uh, uh, sort of leaders of the, of the labor movement in the United States were slow to recognize how important the public sector was. Um, and slow to, to, I mean, there wasn't even a public employees division in uh, the AFL-CIO until 1974. So very slow to kind of recognize um, where they were. So I, it's an interesting counterfactual. Um, and I think in some ways, the premise of your question gives us the answer. Because if, if private sector unions, in order for private sector unions to be stronger, I think there would have had to have been a much sort of firmer connection uh, in the labor movement more generally. So that's kind of where I, where I am now, uh, but I'm still sort of working through that question. It's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, I don't know who had their hand up first, so I'll let you duke it out. Yeah, um, I'm just curious, education seems like it stands out in the idea of fostering communication, or foster competition utilizing public dollars. Mm -hmm. Like for example, there's an inherent competition between whether I use my local library or I go to a bookstore and purchase a book. Mm -hmm. I don't get my local tax money back that went to that public library if I go to a bookstore. Mm -hmm. Or I can take my kids to a park or I can take them to Great America. I don't get my parks money portion of my taxes back to take them to an amusement park. So there's an inherent competition all the time in how we choose, how we make those choices. Education seems to me to be the only place where there is even talk or experimenting with taking the public funds and saying, I get that portion back and I can use it in a choice to take my kid to a private school. Has that been your experience in researching education? Have you come up with any other examples where there's this sort of voucher-like um, scheme that plays out in other competition? Well, I, th I think actually, um, I think one of the reasons it seems so dramatic in education is because um, uh, education as a publicly funded, essentially monopolistic institution goes back so far in American history, right? So common schools go back uh, you know, to the 1820s and 1830s. Um, I think there, I mean, think about healthcare, for example, right? We don't have a, we, we definitely have market competition in, in healthcare. That's, that's kind of the uh, assumptions behind the Affordable Care, Care Act and why we didn't move to a sort of less competitive uh, kind of system. So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on you know all these other you know sort of fields of American life, but it, it does strike me that education is something that it seems like it's much more dramatic because it's it's been uh, for such a really long period of time something that essentially there was no competition in, right? And, and we've sort of reified ideas about why competition is important in something like healthcare, which to me just seems like the the most you know important kind of thing comparison point. The, the most likely comparison. I don't know if that totally answers your question. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. In the quotations you reported, I hear a lot of people ex um, expressing ideas about let's bring commercial logics into schools. Maybe that's a voucher system, maybe that's something else. Let's mm -hmm. spend money this way, let's spend money that way, let's not spend money on salaries for teachers or whatever it may be. But I didn't hear, 
fundamental questioning of the existence of teachers' unions. Did I miss it, or do you think I'm mischaracterizing? You can have those debates yeah. about allocations and principles on which to organize the educational system. That's a different question from whether the principle of the existence of teachers' unions or public unions more generally is a valid one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, a good question. Uh, so those, those ideas are there. Um, I'm uh, not so much uh, focusing on those in this case because I'm you know, was really trying to, to uh, show the connection to this sort of bigger ideology. What's, what's interesting about the, um, these quotes uh, from 1981, and there's, there's more, I mean, there's you know, a sizable amount of this stuff going on in the, in the public sphere, especially because it's right after Free to Choose comes out, um, is that what, what these quotes are basically, and I could have included uh, more context here, uh, basically what they say is, the unions have ruined the schools, but we're not going to be able to do anything about it because they're so powerful. We need to find kind of a workaround, right? Um, so those discussions are there. I'm just kind of uh, skipping a step. I think the two things definitely go sort of hand in hand. Um, earlier in the decade, uh, um, say in, in Philadelphia in particular, uh, that's where by the end of that first strike, you might hear people saying, well, maybe uh, uh, teachers shouldn't belong to unions. Maybe no one should belong to unions because look at what unions sort of inherently do uh, toward the public. Um, so the ideas are there, uh, most definitely, and, and I think they're they're intimately related. Yeah, it's a great question, Patrick. Yeah. So I have a question that's somewhat analogous to the one that Connie asked about private and public sector unions, but on the employment employer side. Okay. So the other thing that's going on in the early '70s is that there's really what a lot of people have characterized as sort of a re revolution that's underway uh, on the part of business. Mm -hmm. And w which starts out with a sort of a panic attack, a reaction to the, the Powell memo. The Powell memo yeah. is the you know, great example of this. Um, reacting not only to what went on with respect to the Johnson administration, but under a Republican administration, there's this, this tremendous expansion of the public sector and rights for labor and all sorts of things. So, you know, and they get incredibly well organized. I mean, this is a period when all these, I mean, the Heritage Foundation is created, the Air American Enterprise Institute, Business Roundtable, it's when National Association of Manufacturers moves from New York to DC. There's a whole slew of things. So they too, you know, this is the, the sort of power the building block that makes possible a neoliberal revolution in a real way and mm -hmm. living out what um, Friedman's idea of you know gobbling up all these arenas including education but you know a whole bunch of others so how does that enter into the story at the local level and the interaction between mm, national and local you know developments around these mm -hmm. schools yeah, I mean that's that's a that's a fantastic question, and uh, I don't I don't know the answer to it. Um, um, you know, uh, so for example, um, uh, tomorrow we're going to talk a little bit about one of those organizations, although not so much a, a pro corporate organization, the National Right to Work Committee, uh, and how in particular uh, they they use uh, really specific uh, local uh, battles over public sector unionization as a way to make larger arguments about labor unions. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't studied you know, groups like the Chamber of Commerce um, so much. Um, uh, so I, I, it, it's a fantastic question. I, I, you know, and, and was one of the things, uh, one of the critiques I've gotten about uh, from one of the anonymous reviewers on my latest round was to consider corporate actors more. Um, but I think, you know, I don't think they're doing a lot with schools specifically, local school districts, at least on a, at least on a local level, uh, at least from what I've found so far, uh, just from the, the little stuff that I've done in the 70s. They seem to be focused on bigger picture kinds of things, like the business roundtable is prominently, um, is really important in uh, the fil filibustering labor law reform, for example, in the late 70s. And so I, so I do think it's still, uh, especially in the early 70s, 70s, it's still this kind of inchoate uh, time. You know, they're still uh, thinking things through. The National Chamber of Commerce hasn't really uh, become concert, you know, hardcore political until the mid 70s. Um, 
So it's a, it's a great question. That's what I know about it. Okay. Uh, right here and then right here. Well, I want to ask you a question actually about something you didn't talk about. Okay. Well, so I apologize ahead of time. That's all right. Um, it sounds like you start your argument at looking at the 1970s and the way that this labor liberal compact dissolves. Uh -huh. I'm wondering if you could speculate on how the labor liberal compact could have been reformed to make it more robust to some of the state failures and the fiscal crisis. What, what were, I guess I'm asking you to start, to look, to tell us a little bit of the backstory before 1970. What happened that this compact was fragile enough to not sustain some of these economic crises, I guess, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's an enormous question and something uh, a lot of smarter people than me have, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, have kind of devoted uh, attention to. Um, but I do think uh, that, uh, you know, in particular, the, I, think, I think the liberalism was limited in how far it was willing to go. So uh, just to use the, the kind of big uh, crises that I talked about, um, I think there were people making really powerful critiques of um, the ways that urban political economy had limited opportunities, just for example, for African Americans, right? So if you read some of the stuff that uh, Kwame Ture, you know, has, has very powerfully uh, sort of written about. And, um, you know, the, there were attempts to kind of move, very limited attempts, so I'm thinking about something like, uh, in, the, in the early 70s, Nixon actually signs into a, uh, uh, signs a pretty substantial revenue sharing bill uh, revenue sharing law um, into existence. And so what that means is that when, um, uh, it means that uh, uh, cities dependent on their sort of need and also the number of people that they have receive more dollars from the federal government to make up for these kind of shortfalls that they have. Um, that basically f uh, flounders when you start to have um, the major fiscal crises in the 70s and the fact that the federal government is, is uh, cutting down on spending as well. So for example, there's a really interesting debate during the New York City fiscal crisis where the mayor, a Democratic mayor, is arguing we need to go even beyond just um, uh, revenue sharing. We need counter-cyclical revenue sharing. So particularly when the economy goes bad, we need more money in the cities. That's what's going to you know, sort of help to uh, shift things. Um, so I think... Uh, um, the lack of vision, what's politically possible, um, to the extent that there are these kind of more visionary things being bandied around in the early 70s, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, fiscal crisis and all this sort of uh, toxic brew of all these bad things that are happening, they take them and they just sort of wring them out of, of possibility. Um, I also think uh, that the labor movement bears a good portion of the responsibility for this. Um, not getting behind uh, civil rights, and Will, this is something you've talked about in your work, not getting behind civil rights early enough or robustly enough. And uh, so I think um, uh, the inability to create a sort of wider sense of solidarity in part is what allowed things to break apart so easily. So I don't know how well that answers your question, but it's my speculation. It's a great, it's a fantastic question. I have a question about, uh, with an eye towards like the period that you cover, but also really, is, for me, it's a question about political strategy now. Mm -hmm. And that's a question of, of, of geography. You have the, what I just see, there was just, maybe just the one, like a letter to the, I don't forget the letter from who who, but about Philadelphia and the death of that city. Uh, being uh, in making the argument that, that the fate of the suburbs is tied to the fate of the city. Yeah. And um, you know, you think about that time, you know, like white flight is you know well underway, and and I, mean, I don't know if it's called white flight at the time, but that there's certainly a kind of um, uh, you know movement uh, and transformation of the cities and the suburbs. Um, you know, but at that time, largely based on that, but. Uh, that brought up this, that brings up this question of, you know, how effective can any one of these um, these places that are governed under, uh, you know, one geographically specific and 
administrative unit, um, how, how can they act in isolation, right, from the others in a political, you know, to, mm -hmm. to like, a, you know, political effect, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like the, the question then and the question now uh, is, uh, you know, how do we um, present a kind of uh, argument for translocal uh, action, right? You know, like, uh, 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 how, how can these, these labor actions be coordinated um, across uh, these divisions, these inherited divisions of these administrative units, right? Um, and like, okay, so like that time, what, you know, the, the casual whatever uh, diagnosis would be, okay, that like white flight was like a major, the major thing going on. But now, what is it going on, right? What, what is it, what are the conditions that, I mean, in, like in the city that we're in now, there's a kind of re-territorialization. Gentrification, now. yeah. Um, so, you know, what do we, how can we even talk about it, I guess, is what <coughs> um, Besides, beyond going to, beyond, so beyond the generalization and the abstraction of saying, oh, our fates are tied to each other. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? I mean, you know, tactically, I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, I think, uh, I think we have to, I think we have to develop a, a vocabulary, first of all, for dealing with neoliberalism as a, as a systemic um, and, and uh, strategic ideology. I mean, I, I think, and I, this is, I don't know what I'm thinking about this, but, you know, you think about, uh, Ecuador, for example, right? Ecuador's constitution has a critique of neoliberalism basically built into it. Um, that's the kind of vocabulary that I think uh, people on the left in this country need to have, right? That it's, you know, uh, you think about uh, the term class warfare, right? And how it's been appropriated to mean that anybody who criticizes uh, the sort of way wealth is distributed in this country is engaging in class warfare. And I think we have to, uh, uh, Take that vocabulary and, you know, create a situation in which uh, we understand that that's actually class warfare. You know, and I, and I think uh, Occupy Wall Street did a pretty good job of that in some ways. Um, obviously, it had its, its its flaws, but I mean, essentially, it was repressed by the police. Um, but I think that helped to change the conversation a little bit in this country uh, around. Um, in some ways, it almost kind of harkens back to the late 19th century Knights of Labor, that it's basically the rich and everybody else. And I think that's a really good starting point, to say there's the rich and then there's everybody else. Because, and obviously there's more class distinctions that we need to deal with, but if that's the first place we can start, that's something, okay? So I think we've got to change vocabulary, number one, and, it, and I think, frankly, the only way that labor movements have ever been successful is through the day-to-day -day, um, nitty gritty of organizing. And um, it's hard, it's extremely hard work. I mean, I'm, I'm doing that right now at, at, at University of Wisconsin Green Bay. And it's the amount of work that you put in, as I'm sure a lot of people in here know, the payoff can be minimal at, at times. But uh, I think, the, to me, that's tactically the only answer I see is, is using the process of building these solidarities um, as a way to articulate a kind of powerful critique, and beyond that, you know, those are all, those are pretty much all the ideas I have. But uh, I mean, that's that is the question. So hopefully, we can talk more about that tomorrow. I'm going to be talking a bit about that tomorrow. So. Yeah.